the, the, the individual um, did not determine the rhythm. The rhythm was done by the AED, the automated external defibrillator, which will assess and tell you whether it is a shockable rhythm or it's not a shockable rhythm. With ACLS, the team or mainly the team leader or he or she can delegate. When it gets the rhythm and pulse assessment, you will have to determine if your rhythm is a rhythm that will send you to the shockable rhythm algorithm, i.e. are you dealing with a cardiac arrest or you are dealing with a tachycardia or breath, you should be able to determine which rhythm you are dealing with. And over the period, we've noticed that in some individuals um, have challenges in determining which rhythm they are dealing with. So we, if you remember as part of the, the initial orientation, AHA does not um, um, teach ECG. They presume ECG and pharmacology is something that the participants themselves should have done some work on. But we want to be able to carry on as a team because the essence of this training that um, is being sponsored by GI as a champion um, by the Kolebu team is to get as many of us to save lives. So mm -hmm. the essence is to get everybody to go through the program and everybody gets his or her AHA and ACLS card. Um, we don't want to have a situation where after the training we'll have to do um, a lot of remediation, which we call in quote reset, to be able to get people to finish because it's been paid for and sponsored by someone. But there's, there's a limit to how many remediation or we can do. But we want everybody to be able to pass just like everybody passed the BLS beautifully. So that's the essence of this training. It's not going to be ECG in detail that is going to make us ECG experts in the day, but it's focused on the ACLS for us to appreciate and be able to run a code effectively. So on, on the once again, I want to say thank you for joining us. I have um, with us for starting to, we, those of us uh, starting on 21st, we have Dr. Terry and also Dr. Solomon on, and they are all going to be um, instructors for the 21st, starting the 21st March. And I want to thank them for joining us. So if you, as you could see, the first slide is, um, you could see a name, a Professor Yawasanti Wuku. So this is not my slide. It is a slide that I've kept for years. Um, when we, he taught us ECG, we had a tutorial with him. So I've kept it over the years and I always ask him for permission to reuse it. So I maintain his name on it. So the essence of this presentation today is to let us be able, when you see an EC, when we show you the rhythm, you can tell that this rhythm is a bradycardia, it's a tachycardia. It's up to you to determine whether it's stable or unstable, which we will learn. You'll be able to tell this is a pulseless electrical activity. This is an AC stove. You'll be able to tell this is a narrow complex regular tachycardia, a narrow complex irregular tachycardia, a wide complex regular tachycardia, a wide complex irregular tachycardia. If you've noticed, I've not said uh, ventricular tachycardia, I've not said ventricular fibrillation necessarily. But the essence of doing that is to let you appreciate what to, how to make a decision. If after the training, you can tell straight away that it's a VF, it's a VT, that is what we expect. And that is what will, that is the, the, the ultimate goal. But if you're unable to tell straight away whether it's a VT or an atrial fibrillation or an atrial flutter, one simple way, which will still let you make a, a good clinical decision is to say either it's a wide complex regular tachycardia, a wide complex irregular tachycardia, or a narrow complex regular tachycardia, or narrow complex irregular tachycardia to be able to make a clinical decision. So basically, that is what we are come to learn. So we start with um, the objectives mainly is to recognize the normal sinus rhythm, to be able to recognize the common rhythm disturbances to recognize, in this case, ignore the acute myocardial infarction because that's not the emphasis of this is for rhythm recognition and to identify AV nodal blocks, not specifically the AV, but if you're able to identify it, it helps you make a decision earlier 
but we are more interested in able to tell whether it's a bradycardia or not. So um, one thing that we were taught is when you see one, you do one and you teach one, and that is how we all learn. So if we, from today, after learning how to uh, interpret ECG, you should be able to be able, you should learn how to perform an ECG and teach someone, and that is how you learn. So that has been his philosophy. You see one, you do one, and you teach one. So for um, the when it comes to ECG, in simple terms, the ECG is like. Um, The ECG is considered a car. You know, a car has a mechanical component, component and electrical components. Um, though now we are having solar vehicles, etc. So the electrical component makes the car move, spark, that turns the engine on. And basically, when you, we are talking about ECG, we are looking at the electrical activity of the heart. So the heart, we know its main function is a pump. And to be able to pump, it needs electricity, it needs fuel. In this case, the fuel is in the comes in the form of electricity. So the electrical wires that tend to power the heart muscle to be able to pump. And those wires have been designed in a conduction system such that there is the, the, there is the production source, like you have the Akosombo dam, and there are wires that will transport the electricity we have grid coal and substations. Basically, that is what this is about. So you have the conduction system make, main, mainly with the SC node, which usually we call the pacemaker of the heart, which would um, set the pace at which the heart should beat. So the SC node says the pace and the information And the information then goes from the SA node to the AV node. But before it goes to the AV node, the SA node tends to send electrical activity to the atria, which is the upper part, which we all know. So SA node to atria, then it goes through the interatrial pathway so that both atria will be able to undergo depolarization. Then there's the AV node where there's a bit of a delay so that the atria can under the electrical activity can deep the atria can undergo depolarization, which will subsequently lead to atrial contraction. So that when you have that AV delay, that delay will, will prevent both the atria and the ventricle contracting at the same time. Imagine the atria is supposed to pump blood into the left ventricle. So the depolarization will have to occur first in the atria so that the atria can contract and push the blood into the ventricle. If the two of them are doing it at the same time, then it means that as the atria is contracting, the ventricle is also contracting and at the end, there will be a negative effect. No blood will go into the um, left ventricle. So that will have to happen first. Then the AV node is causing that delay. From the AV node, the information will then travel to the bundle of his, which is located there. Then the bundle of his divides into right and left. And that will also send information to, into the ventricles through the Peckingji. So basically that is how the electricity travels from the SA node, then interatrial pathways to allow for atrial depolarization. There's a delay in the AV node to allow atrial depolarization to complete and diastole to complete with the atrial contraction then the bundle of phase then sends the electrical activity to the right and left bundle to the pecking fibers to the ventricles for the ventricles to also undergo depolarization. So if this is occurring, then it will lead to what we call a sinus rhythm. So basically what we have here is, we are going to demonstrate, so you see, the first component of it, which is the information from the SA node. So the SA node deploys the atrium or deploys the atria through the interatrial pathways, and that will give you your P wave. So the atria depolarization gives you your P wave. And basically the P wave that you get 
should have the uniform morphology. And if we divide it into two, we say the first half of it is the right atrium and the second part of it is the left atrium. But like I said, that is not the emphasis of this presentation. The emphasis of this presentation is to allow us to be able to identify a sinus rhythm and PEA, make a decision on how to manage our patient. And when you have the AV nodal delay, which is delaying the impulse from traveling from the atria to the ventricles, that is what is represented on the ECG as the PR segment. Okay, then from there, you have the information traveling through the bundle of fields and its branches into the ventricles, and the ventricles will also depolarize, and that will give you what the QRS complex. The QRS complex, the Q is the first negative deflection. That means it goes below the isoelectric line, which we'll show, and the R is the first positive wave, and the S will be the second. So basically, it's a QRS complex. Then there will be ventricular repolarization, which is represented as the T wave. So like we said, the P represents the atrial depolarization, which we've represented there. Then we have the QRS complex representing ventricular depolarization, which we can see. Then we have the T wave representing ventricular repolarization. And we use it synonym, synonymously as when the ventricles are relaxing, but they are not really synonymous, but we'll take it as such. And there will be where then when does the atria repolarize? It occurs during the ventricular depolarization. So that is not seen on the ECG is because it's occurring when you're having your KRS complex. So consider it behind your KRS complex. So that's your T wave representing the ventricular repolarization. Then we spoke about the PR interval, which represents the delay um, so that the information will, the, the SA node will finish depolarizing the atria before the information gets to the ventricle to prevent the two beating at the same time. So atrial depolarization plus the delay in the AV junction gives you your PR interval. Okay, so like we said, when it comes to pacemakers of the heart, we usually say the SA node is the pacemaker, but every tissue of the conduction system can actually take the role of the pacemaker, including the myocardium itself, the ventricles. But the, the, what usually happens is that the SA node usually is the pacemaker, so its rate is higher, it's able to beat at 60 to 100, then the AV node can also take up if there's any problem with the SA node. So the SA node is unable to determine the pace in activity of the heart, the AV node can take over and usually beats at 40 to 60 beats per minute. Then the ventricles itself can also take over and the beat at 20 to 45. Like I said, the bundle of his can also take over the junction and all of them can take over the pacer activity of the heart. So we look at a standard 12 lead ECG, or imagine this to be your monitor, but on the monitor, you will see the deep pink and the light pink line. So on the ECG strip, you see a square with um, um, the, the, the borders of the square, the, the bigger square, the lines are thick. So in, in some, you see it at, as um, blue, deep blue, some are green, some are pink. So in this case, I think it's pink or red. So within that big box, there are smaller boxes within it. So if you could see, um, please, can you see the, 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 the pointer? Hello? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Okay, so this is the, the thick square box I'm talking about, which has been taken out of this square. So is, is this square that we've blown out here. So within that, you see one, two, three, four, five tiny boxes and on the vertical axis. And you also see one, two, three, four, five on the horizontal axis. Now. When you take a standard 12-lead ECG, 
usually the speed at which we are running the ECG is 25 milliseconds. So when you take the ECG and you confirm the patient's name, the age to be sure is the person and the date and time because ECG varies from date and time. I could have done the ECG in the morning. In the morning, I may be tachycardic. In the next hour, I may be bradycardic. So it's important to state, to notice that the date and time is clearly stated and the name of the person is there. So you, and below the 12 bleed ECG, you see the speed, which is usually 25 millisecond. Uh, that is the speed and the height which represents the voltage, you see 10 millimeters stroke millivolt. So said that it means that every small boss like this vertical here will be one millimeter, one millimeter, one millimeter or one millivolts. Okay, now the big square, as you see, the one with the bolding line represents 200 milliseconds, which is 0 0.2 seconds. So some work with the milliseconds, some work with the um, seconds. So is 200 milliseconds or 0 0.2 seconds. So if you have one, two, three, four, five, which is 200 and you divide by five, then it means that every small box will be 40 millisecond or 0 0.04 second. So 0 0.04, 0 0.04, 0 0.04, 0 0.04, 0 0.04, one millimeter, two millimeter, three millimeters, four millimeters, like that. So basically, that is what it is. Now, so it's going to show you what we have expanded. So this is what I've briefly explained. So if you take the ECG, um, basically they are cutoffs. So the leads usually are represented, there are 12 leads. Um, we have the chest leads, which are v V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, V6. Then we have the limb leads, which are lead one, lead two. And we have lead, the, yes, the lead one, two, three. And we have the augmented leads, which start with the A, AVF, AVR, and AVL. So you, those are 12, they give you 12 views of the heart. But when you are putting the leads, usually, we put um, 10 leads to give you a 12 ECG, but we are not going to go into that. This one is to let us appreciate how to interpret the basic rhythm. So you can easily deduce, we said what? A big boss is 200 milliseconds, okay? Or 0 0.2 seconds. So if you count 15 boxes and you multiply the 15 large boxes, okay, by 0 0.2, then you're going to get three seconds. So you can deduce the seconds by counting the number of boxes and multiplying by, if you are going by 200 milliseconds or 0.2 seconds, you can easily deduce. So this is telling you if you have 15 large boxes and you multiply by 0 0.2 seconds, it gives you the three seconds, which some of the ECG strips mark it's on the sheets. Okay. so. You may have a rhythm strip usually at the lower part of the ECG, which is a longer strip. Some are six seconds, some are 10 seconds, but we'll learn how to use them, either the six seconds or the 10 seconds. So now when it comes to looking at a rhythm, we show you a rhythm, and a rhythm. How are you going to approach it? The first thing is to determine whether the rhythm is sinus or not. That is the most important thing is to determine whether this rhythm is a sinus rhythm or not. And what we mean by sinus rhythm, when we say sinus rhythm, what we are saying is that the pacemaker is the SA node. The SA node is what is determining the rate at which the heart is beating and how the information is being sent across. So it means the information comes from the SA node, it depolarizes the atria, then the, there's a delay at the AV node, before the ventricles get depolarized. So you see a P wave before every QRS complex because when the SA node depolarizes, it sends the information into the atria and the atria will depolarize and give you a P wave. And there's that delay before the QRS complex. So when you're having the P wave before every QRS complex, then we say the ECG, the rhythm is what? It's a sinus rhythm. Now, when you determine that it's sinus, 
The next thing is you want to ask yourself, you are going to calculate the rate, but the rate determine, depends on whether your rhythm is irregular or regular. And how do you determine the regularity? The regularity basically depends on the interval between the peak of the KRS complex, which we say the RR interval. So basically, if it's regular, it means from here to here will be the same as from here to here. And it will cut across, then it is regular. If it's irregular, it means the distance between the RR will vary. So if you are not sure, if you can't visually determine it, you can take a paper, put the paper on the ECG, the rhythm strip, mark two RR interval and move the paper across and see if it will align with the RR interval. If it does, then you can say it is regular. Now, if you determine the regularity, then the rate is easier because if it is irregular, there's an easier way of calculating the heart rate. If it is an irregular rhythm, there's also a way of calculating the heart rate. If it is a regular rhythm, all you have to do is to look for the number of two large boxes between two selected RR. So let's say you select this R and that R. Then you ask yourself, how many big boxes? When we say big boxes, the one with the bolding lines, how many of them can I count between two RR? Now, that will serve as the denominator. And the numerator is 300. So your, your heart rate will be 300 divided by the number of big boxes between the RR. So if you assume that this, R, this RR interval has one, two, three big boxes, okay, then your heart rate is 300 divided by three, which will be what, 100. But if you are unable to get two like clearly large boxes and there are extra smaller boxes, just like this one, you have one big box, two, three, and you have an extra two smaller boxes, then you cannot apply the rule of the large boxes because you don't have definitely large boxes in between. So you can use the smaller boxes. That's the 40 milliseconds or the 0 0.04 second boxes. And that one, the numerator, the numerator will be 1,005. So it is going to be one, two, three large boxes with each large box containing five smaller boxes. So that's 15. Then you have 16, 17. So your heart rate will be 1,005 divided by 17. So for a regular rhythm, you take the RR interval. If there are large boxes in between, use 300 divided by the number of large boxes. But if you can get large boxes and they are extra smaller boxes, then use a numerator of 1,005 divided by the number of smaller boxes to get the heart rate. So to calculate the rate, so we just demonstrated how to do that. Determine its sinus is important. Determine regularity, then you can use which one to calculate. So I've briefly done that. We've discussed that. Now, in terms of the interval, so I'm going to make it practical. So you ignore this. So you've determined a sinus, P wave before KRS, P wave before KRS, you've determined it is regular. So because it is regular, you've decided to use the regular formula to calculate your heart rate, okay? Which is 300 divided by the number of large boxes or 1,005 divided by the number of smaller boxes between the RR interval. Those are the two main ones. So when you are done with that, the next step is simple. Just follow your ECG. You're starting with a P wave because the SN node gives you your P wave. So you ask yourself, but you don't necessarily need this for the ACLS because we are not going to say the P wave is tall or no, that for ACLS, we don't need that. But this is just, an add-on filler. So you just take the ECG and look at your P wave after determining the sinus, the regularity, and you've calculated your rate. So you look at your P wave. Is my P wave normal? To be able to know what is normal, it means you need to know, to be able to tell it's abnormal, you need to know what is normal. So there are descriptions of a normal P wave, which maybe later we'll be able to go into that. So you look at your P wave, if it's a normal morphology, 
Then the next thing is that from the P, you come to your PR interval because there's an there's a PR interval before your care is complex. You ask yourself, is my PR interval normal or abnormal? So the PR interval is the cutoff we are saying is what? Five smaller boxes, which is a large big box. So 200 milliseconds or 0 0.2 seconds. Okay, so it is three to five. So lower limit is three boxes, which will give you 120 milliseconds or 0 0.12 seconds. And the maximum is the big box, which is 200 milliseconds. So if your PR interval is more than 200 milliseconds, we say it is prolonged. If it is less than the three smaller boxes, which is 120 milliseconds or 0 0.12 seconds, we say it was short. Then after your PR interval, you look at what? Your QRS complex. Okay, you ask yourself, is your QRS complex narrow or broad? What do we mean by QRS complex narrow or broad? Basically, if your QRS complex is more than three bo smaller boxes, if it's more than 0 0.12 seconds, we say it is what? Broad. If it is less than that, we say it is narrow. So you just ask yourself, okay, P wave, normal morphology, PR interval, prolonged, KRS complex, narrow, broad. Okay, now from there, you're moving from your KRS complex to your T wave. So you can ask yourself, my T wave, is it normal? or abnormal, but like I said, you should be able to know the normal and abnormal. This is not the emphasis, but it's, it's to let you appreciate it. Then when you are done with that, the next thing is, what is the distance from the beginning of my QRS complex to the end of the T wave, which is the QT interval? So basically to analyze ECG, you just have to follow the steps. So a P, PR interval, QRS complex, and a T wave, Th that's the basic and you will be able to have a fair understanding. So when you are done, then you ask yourself, what is it telling me, putting it all together? So basically that's what we've done here. So for this one, we are going to calculate the heart rate for this one. Now, before we do this, because of time, let me do the irregular. So assuming you did your RR interval, Okay, and you realize that it's irregular. Because it's irregular, you can't just choose two RR interval and count the number of boxes, either big or smaller boxes to determine your heart rate because the RR interval is variable. So in that sense, you cannot calculate the heart rate with 1,005 over number of smaller boxes or 300 over the number of big boxes. So what you do is that what is heart rate? Heart rate is beats per minute. So all you need is one minute. And the ventricular rate basically is your, in simple terms, it's your QRS complex. So each QRS complex represents a heart, a ventricular beat in simple terms. So if I'm able, I can count one minute because imagine we are saying that a, a big box like this, is 200 milliseconds and we say 15 boxes is three seconds. If we want one minute, we will need a, long EC, a longer ECG strip, which would not be economical or practical. So what do you do? You go to your rhythm strip. If your rhythm strip is a six second strip, you count the number of QRS complexes within that six seconds. So this is a six second strip. So let's assume it is irregular. So we are counting one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So we counted nine QRS complexes in six seconds. Now we said heart rate is beats per minute. And we are saying that a beat is what? A QRS complex. A minute is 60 seconds, but I don't have 60 seconds, but I have what? Six seconds. So if I want 60 seconds, I multiply six seconds by 10 to give me 60 seconds, which will be one minute. So then the number of QRS complex I count within the six seconds, I multiply by 10 to give me the heart beats in one minute, which is my heart rate. So you do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, 
eight, nine. So nine carries complex in six seconds. So I multiply by 10. So my heart rate, my ventricular rate is what? 90 beats per minute. That is the principle. So I will want one of us to determine the heart rate for this patient. This is a regular rhythm. Um, one of us to determine the heart rate. Let us know which heart, what, what the heart rate of this patient is. Uh, I'm coming, I need to unmute. Well, so you can lift your hands. Uh, Dominic. Do I have Dr. Akatiba on? Okay, so you can lift your hand, then we will, I will unmute you for you to determine the heart rate using the regular rhythm, because we are saying this one is regular. So if it is regular, how are you going to calculate the heart rate for this patient? Hello? Just if you want to talk, I will unmute you. You, you raise your hands, then I'll unmute you. Okay, since uh, just to make it lively, they are, I have colleagues that I can I can call. They won't get angry with me. So I'm unmuting Amma Bintua. You can unmute. Is Emma on, please? You did, I'm here. I just log back on. I'm actually awake. Let me take a quick look at it. I'm having. Okay. So bad for So. So for this one, we have a rate of about 100. Beats per minute. Okay, so take us. Which formula did you use? This one is a regular used, rhythm. Yes. So um, I count. Of. Um, small boxes so between two R, two R. So R, R is about, I'm guessing about three um, big boxes of 15. So I did 1,005 divided by, um, by the 15. Okay, okay. So she, she counted um, 15, 15 boxes. But if you look at the others, you see that there's a bit of extra. So maybe you can hear me. Okay, yeah, I can hear you, Amma. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, Amma. Hello. Okay, so I think um, Amma is having a bit of issue with his net her network. But like she rightly said, so she counted 15 boxes, the 1,005 over 15, that was 100. If you use large boxes, it's about three large boxes. But if you're using the smaller one, there's a bit of extra tiny boxes in between. So this one, two, three is clearly 15. But if you look at this, there's another one here, 16, and maybe this one, 17, but you can use 16. So it will still come around the 90 or 90 something if you were using the six seconds shoe. Now, if this was a 10 seconds rhythm strip and you counted the number of KRS complex within it, then you multiply by six because to get 60 seconds, it is 10 seconds times six. And that will give you 60 seconds, which will be one minute. So look at your rhythm strip. Is it a six seconds rhythm strip or a 10 second rhythm strip? then you count the number of KRS complex within it. If it's a six second strip, you multiply the number of KRS complex by 10. If it's a 10 second strip, you count the number of KRS complexes by six. So that is a, a, way, a simpler way of determining the rate in irregular rhythms. You can use it for regular rhythms, but if it's regular, usually 300 divided by the number of big boxes or 1,005 is straight away. So this is what we've discussed. Okay, so that is what we had.
Okay. So this is just um, a representation, making it simple. Okay, that if you have, assuming all this is your RR interval, okay, this board lines, if the distance between the RR interval is just one big box, you're looking at 300 divided by one, which will be what, 300. If it is two large boxes, you are looking at 300 divided by two, which will be 150. If there's three large boxes, you are looking at 300 divided by what, three, which will be 100. If you are looking at four is 75, five is 60, seven, so it goes along. So for a regular rhythm, immediately look at your RR interval is sinus rhythm. You've looked at your RR interval is regular. Straight away, you divide by the number, it's easier. So when you do it often, you can tell this is 150, this is 100, this is 75. You need to practice. Okay. Okay, so we spoke about determining the regularity. Okay, so basically this is what I meant in determining the regularity. Okay, you the distance between the RR interval should be the same. If it's not the same, then it's irregular. Okay, so we've discussed this already. Now we spoke about assessing the P waves, which like I said, is not the emphasis of this um, presentation, because for the ACLS, you are going to determine the rhythm. You're not going to do, for example, say the P wave is broad, so atrial enlargement, that is not the emphasis of this presentation. But this is to let you know that if you want to analyze ECG, then you can analyze each wave individually, each interval individually, and all can give you um, information. So this is talking about the P waves, but like I said, it's not the emphasis of this presentation. On the emphasis of this presentation is does the P come before every care is complete? And if it does, then we say it is sinus. Okay. And we spoke about the PR interval. The PR interval will be important because you'll be having cases of bradycardia. And with cases of bradycardia, you will need to determine um, whether it is first degree, second degree, or third degree, which we'll talk about. That may not necessarily be compulsory. What is important is, is it bradycardic? And if it is, is it stable or unstable? However, if you are able to tell whether it is first degree or second degree or third degree early, you may be able to institute measure, measures earlier than going through the algorithm which may let you lose time if you knew the rhythm of an issue. So it is still good if you're able to tell straight away it is first degree, second degree, third, it will help you make decision. But if you're unable to do so, but you're able to tell it's a bradycardia and you're able to determine whether it's stable or unstable and you go through the algorithm, you will still be able to keep your patient alive. So like we said, the normal is the three small boxes which is 0.12 seconds to the five small boxes, which is 0.2 seconds. So 120 milliseconds to 200 milliseconds or 0.12 seconds to 0.2. Okay, so that is it. So your care is complex to be spoke about it. Is it narrow or is it broad? You should be able to do that. So we said the narrow complex is when it is between the normal range. If it is above 0 0.12, the large, three, large, three small boxes, we say it is what? Broad. And we'll come to appreciate what we, why, when it is broad, what it means. Okay, so summary. So if you look at this rhythm, we say the rate was about 90 to 95. It was regular. P waves are normal. The PR interval was normal. The KRS duration is also within normal range. So it was what? A normal sinus rhythm. So if your PR interval was prolonged, then it changes the conclusion. If your KRS complex was broad, it could still be a sinus rhythm, 
it could still be a sinus rhythm, but that broad QRS complex should tell you something, which we'll get to know. So when it comes to normal sinus rhythm, all we are saying is that the electrical activity is coming from the SA node, which we've already described. So and with normal sinus rhythm, the heart rate is 60 to 100 beats per minute. It's regular, P waves are normal morphology. Your PR interval is normal. Your QRS duration is also with normal usually, but if you have a broad complex, it doesn't necessarily mean it's not sinus. Sinus basically means coming from the SA node, but there are some reasons why your QRS complex will, will be broad. So basically that is it. So if you have any deviation from this, then you ask yourself, are you dealing with a sinus tachycardia, a sinus bradycardia, or as an arrhythmia of sinus origin? Now we are going to the arrhythmias. Now, when you look at the arrhythmias, it means that it's out of norm. The heart is beating, but it's not the normal. So it can arise from the sinus, can arise from the atria cells, can arise from the AV junction, the bundle. Like I said, every part of the conduction system and the myocyte itself can be excited and beat independently and lead to arrhythmia. So with the SA node, basically it's either it's beating too fast or it's beating too slow. So if it's beating too fast, which is if it's more than 100 beats per minute, we say it's a sinus uh, tachycardia. If it's beating too slow, less than the 60 beats per minute, we say it's a sinus bradycardia. Okay, so with the atrium, you can have an atrial fibrillation, which we'll, we'll, we'll show. You can have um, the ventricle also having problem. So the atrials, you can also have atrial flutter. Ventricles, you can have premature ventricular contractions. When we say premature ventricular contractions, they are basically contractions that are coming at a time when they are not supposed to come. Basically, that is what it is. And you can also have premature atrial contractions, but those will not be the emphasis of this presentation. You can have ventricular fibrillation, and you can have a ventricular tachycardia, okay? Now, with the sinus rhythms, if you are looking at the um, arrhythmias, basically we can broadly classify them as above the ventricles. Those that are occurring above the ventricles, we call them supraventricular. And those occurring below the ventricle or within the ventricle, those occurring in the ventricle, below the AV node. So you see supraventricular above the ventricles and those occurring from within the ventricles. Now, to be able to tell whether an arrhythmia is coming from the ventricles or not, it can be difficult. But to simplify it for this purpose, when you see a QRS complex that is broad, okay, broad, which means it's more than 120 milliseconds or 0 0.12 seconds. For ACL, I take it as likely coming from the ventricle especially when the patient is unstable. If it is narrow, then it is coming from above the ventricle. There are reasons why you can have an arrhythmia being broad complex, but it is coming from above the ventricle and not necessarily from within the ventricle. So, but we won't go into that area. For ACLS purposes, if we show you a rhythm that is, is wide complex, take it as likely the patient has a ventricular arrhythmia than a supraventricular arrhythmia with some other associations. So can someone take us through how he or she will approach this based on what we've discussed? So we'll take this as a standard 12, a standard rhythm strip. It was running at um, 25 milliseconds and it's 10 millivolts. So we said you 
how will you approach this ECG? If we give you, we ask you, what rhythm is this? How we want someone to walk us through the steps. We said you need to determine whether it is sinus or not. As in, is it P before every KRS complex? Then when you are done, you determine the regularity. Is it regular or irregular? If it is irregular, there's a way of calculating what the rate. If it is irregular, there's a way you calculate the rate. We just need those two. Okay, then you, the next thing is you do your PR interval to see if it is prolonged or not prolonged. Your PRS complex, is it narrow or broad? QT interval, we did not go into that. But if you could do that, we want to keep it focused with respect to the ACM. So if you, let's say you were running a code and we show you this ECG, what do you think this rhythm is? Can someone walk us through how he or she will approach this one to be able to tell which kind of rhythm we are dealing with? You can raise your hands, then we'll mute you. Hi, Eugene, can I try? Yes, yes, go ahead. Okay, so first of all, we check whether it's um, regular. So we check whether there's a P wave before every QR is complex. And when we look at this, there's a P wave before every QR is complex. We also look at the distance between the RR and then when we look at the distance between the Rs, I think they are the same. Then we calculate the rates by, because it's regular, we can use the boxes criteria. So we count the boxes in between. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then two small boxes. So we use a thousand five over the number of small boxes. And since there are eight big boxes, that'd be eight times five, 40, plus the two accounts at the end. So 42, so 1,005 divided by 42. That gives us 35.7. So the rate is 35. And we said that the normal heart rate is 6,200. So this will be bradycardia, sinus bradycardia. Okay, so it's a sinus bradycardia. Okay, so you were able to, so that is good. So with the ACLS, if you are using a monitor, the monitor will show you the rates. Okay, so you would have seen on the monitor 30 bits per minute, 40 bits per minute. So you, could, you will be able to tell it's a bradycardia. And if you are able to manage the bradycardia without necessarily knowing in the beginning whether it is sinus body, you will still be able to manage your patient if you follow the algorithm. But if you are able to tell whether it is sinus or not, you may move ahead in your decision making. So thank you very much, Bain. So this is a sinus bradycardia, like Baini rightly mentioned. Okay, so he, he went through the steps and that is it. So determine the rate, but before he did, he had to determine the regularity and he said it was regular. So went for 1,005 divided by the number of smaller boxes and made a decision. Then the, the other ones, P wave, PR interval, okay? So it's important to follow it stepwise, it's easier. Is it sinus? No. Is it sinus? Yes. What is my RR interval? Regular, irregular. Regular, you use your formula. Irregular, you use your formula. Then now you can now go to the individual components. But like I said, that is not the main emphasis of this. All right, so sinus bradycardia, we've mentioned that. Okay, so we have a second rhythm. Can someone else take this rhythm, please? 
We have one hour more. So if we don't finish, we may have to do the remaining. So if we contribute, then we move faster. Okay, so if you look at this, we ask ourselves, is this sinus rhythm? Yes, it is sinus. There's a P wave before every KRS complex. Then we determine the regularity. Is it regular or irregular? It appears regular. So if it's regular, we can use 300 divided by the number of big boxes or 1,005 divided by the number of smaller boxes. If we use 1,005, because we are not getting clear distinct big, block, big boxes, there are a bit of smaller boxes. So if we are counting, we have, let's say, one, two, which is 10, plus an additional two, two. okay? Switch will be, let's say, 12. So our heart rate will be 1,005 divided by 12. And that will give us a rate of about 125. Then we look at the P wave. Is it normal morphology, PR interval? Is it normal or short or prolonged? We look at our QRS complex. Is it narrow or broad? Then we can also do acuity, which is not the emphasis. And when we finish, we put it together. So we agree it's sinus, but it is fast. It's beating above 100 beats per minute. So it means it's a tachycardia. But what form of tachycardia is it? Patient is in sinus rhythm, so it is a sinus tachycardia. Okay, so that is it. So we move on. So now we move to the next one. We said the arrhythmias, it could be occurring above the ventricle or below. So we are going to look at the supraventricular arrhythmias. So we have atrial fibrillation, we have atrial flutter, we have paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia. These are not the only arrhythmias that can occur above the ventricle. There are several forms of atrial tachycardias, but this is, let's say, to give us an understanding of how to approach it. So, um, do we think this ECG is sinus? I will want a response, please, so that we know we are all following. Do we think this is sinus? No, please. Okay, why Why is it no. not sinus? Um, I can't see a clear P wave in front of each QRS. Good, so you can see a clear P wave before every care is complex. So that's good, so it's not sinus. So if determine that it's not sinus. So the next thing is to determine what? The regularity of the RR interval. Good, so what do you do? What is your uh, verdict on the regularity? It's irregular. It's irregular, okay. So how will you determine the rate of this patient? So consider the, the strip as six seconds. Okay, so you count the number of QRSs that you have and multiply by 10. So I okay, think- Okay, so let's go, let's go ahead and count. There are 10 of them, so the rate is 100. Okay, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And you multiply by ten, so it's hundred. Good. So, will you go ahead and measure, um, do a PR interval for this patient? No, since I can't see P waves. Okay. Now your KRS complex are they narrow or broad? I think they are narrow. Okay, they are narrow. Okay, good. So at the end, putting all this together, what will be your conclusion for this patient? What rhythm is this? 
Yes, it's a narrow complex tachycardia irregular. Good. So for ACLS purposes, you can see this is a narrow irregular complex, but it was 100. It wasn't above 100. So you can't necessarily say it's a tachycardia, but that is a very good answer. So it's narrow irregular rhythm. So they are differentials that can give you this. So assuming the heart rate was 120, yes, it's a narrow irregular complex tachycardia. With that, you can still make a decision for ACLS and manage your patient. Okay, if you are able to say straight away what rhythm it is, that is a plus. But if you're unable to say it, don't beat yourself up. Just say it's a narrow irregular complex, narrow complex irregular tachycardia because you can still make a decision on that. Because with that, the differentials are there. So this could be an atrial fibrillation, okay? So if you can say, if you're able to tell straight away it's an atrial fibrillation, mm -hmm. that is good. But if you're unable to say straight away it's an atrial fibrillation, and you say it's a narrow, complex, irregular tachycardia, you can still manage your patients following the algorithm. So we, if you are running a code as a team leader, and it's time for rhythm and pulse check, and we show you this rhythm, and you are standing there because you want to say it's atrial fibrillation necessarily. No, no, no we, we are not going to hold you hard on that. If you are able to say it's a narrow, complex, irregular tachycardia, you can still go ahead and, 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 and manage. Okay. Please, I have a question, Eugene. Yeah, please go ahead. Um, please, um, so did you say earlier that the normal QRS duration was one to three boxes, or I didn't get you right? I so we said we are using a cutoff of three boxes. Three boxes. 120, 120 milliseconds as the cutoff for narrow or broad. Okay, so normal is three so boxes. There, yeah, three. Within, should be within three boxes. Okay, so less than three is abnormal. So less than three is narrow complex. So and we then, are saying that the, we, with narrow complex is what we expect to be to be the norm. Because okay. if you are going through the normal conduction system, it should be very fast. So you should be able to get your carriers complex within the shortest time. Okay, but so it's exactly, sorry. Yeah, I'm listening. Yes, yeah, so I was asking, so it has to be exactly three. Exactly. Or less. Or less, to be normal. Yes. To be normal, yes. Okay, so, so if it's one, is it abnormal? That's so 0 0.04, like if you saw, we said 0 0.04 to 0 0.12 seconds. So because this looked like it was one, that's why I was asking. Oh yeah, it's normal, it's narrow complex. Like I said, in the ACLS, when you're running the code, what do you need necessarily that is it narrow complex or is it wide complex? If you uh -huh. are able to, to make a distinct diagnosis and say, this is atrial fibrillation, fair. Mm -hmm. but so one, we, so so one to less than three is narrow, is that right? Yeah, one to upper limit of three for the ACLS. If it's above three, it's wide complex. Some so references like, make it greater than or equal to 0 0.12, which is the three. So from the three and above is wide complex. For the purposes of to present this, we are using above three as wide. Okay, all right, thank you. All right, you're welcome. So, if we are giving, if it is time for rhythm and pulse check, and you are checking the pulse of this patient, okay, and you put your hands there, and we tell you there is a pulse, the next decision you have to make, okay, there's a narrow, narrow complex regular tachycardia, narrow irregular complex mm -hmm. tachycardia. So when you make that decision, then you ask yourself, does this patient have features that make it stable or unstable, then you make a decision on that. We don't expect you to say it's atrial fibrillation. If you're able to do it, good, that is a plus. But when say this one said atrial fibrillation, this one couldn't say it was atrial fibrillation. So it's a, a negative point, you understand? So I want you to appreciate that so that you have that confidence that you can use that approach. So you can narrow complex irregular tachycardia. I think it may be an atrial fibrillation or you can go straight and say it's an atrial fibrillation, if you are sure of that. Okay, so let's continue. 
So the rate was 100, just as she determined it was irregular. The P waves were not present. The PR interval, you cannot, like she rightly said, KRS complex was narrow. So rightly, she interpreted it as a narrow, complex, irregular tachycardia for which an atrial fibrillation can be like that. Okay, so that is it. So can someone else take this one, please? By going through the steps we've discussed. Hello? There is no right or wrong answer here. Like we said, we are all learning so that when we are running the code, we can all run a very beautiful code, a smooth code, and at the end, we can all um, save lives. There's no right or wrong answer. Just follow the steps. Do you see P waves before every KRS complex? Are they regular? or irregular. It's my, if I see a P wave, is it, does it look normal? Does it look abnormal? What is my PR mm -hmm. interval? What is my KRS complex? Basically, that's all we are saying for this one. Okay. So, nice. Hello? Yeah, hello. Yeah. So um, I don't see any P wave before any QRS complex. OK. So um, but uh, so I won't say it's a sinus rhythm. OK. Um, the QRS complexes are equal. I the RR interval are equal. The, yes, the RR intervals are. They look so like what does equal. that tell you? Um, regular they, or irregular? They will tell me about, well, if they are equal, then it may presuppose that it's a regular. So it's regular, okay. What next? It's regular. It would be able to help me determine the rates. Okay, good. So what is the rate for this patient? So the rate, there are three boxes that are complete, plus one, two, three, looks like four. Okay. So there what are formula boxes. are you using? Okay. So I'll just, because the four, four boxes seem particularly complete. Okay. I would, I would use 300 over, Four. Okay. Yeah. And that will give so, you what? Uh, so that will be 75. Okay. 75. So, and what's the next thing you want to do? Um, I'll look at the QRS complex intervals. Okay. Um, I think so it's just you... one box. One maximum okay. two boxes, small boxes. Okay. So this is a narrow complex. Okay, good. So what will be your conclusion for this one? Well, I've seen this before, this rhythm before. Okay. Uh, this looks like atrial flutter, actually. Good. So, yeah. so, so that's the right answer. So if you are able to tell straight away it's an atrial flutter, fine. But if you don't know, Clearly, what you are seeing looks like a sore tooth. Yeah, okay, sore what tooth. we describe as a sore tooth appearance. So it's an atrial flutter. But assuming we show you this rhythm, and we said that the rate was 160. Okay, and you don't know that it is an atrial flutter. How will you conclude? I would say it's a a narrow complex. Uh, tachycardia or something. Okay, sure. but you need to qualify the tachycardia with your KRS complex because that is going to, going to help you make a decision. Okay, so we say it's a narrow, complex, irregular tachycardia. 
Okay. Like you said, it's regular. So it's a narrow, complex, regular card. But clearly with this, there's so to So, but if you can't say it, it's a narrow, complex, regular tachycardia. And you get to know why doing that makes you still be able to manage your patients without necessarily making Mentioning an the, error. Sure you understand? have a question. Yes, please, go ahead. Why is it tachycardia since the heart rate is 75? No, no, so I no, told no, him no, assuming the heart rate. Not I said, assuming the heart rate is 160, and that's why he responded. Right, right. okay, cool. Okay, so um, Maurice had his um, had hand up, Maurice. Uh, Maurice, can you come in, please? Yeah, I'm here, I'm here. Yeah, your hand was up. No, it was just to un help, ask you to unmute me whilst I. Oh, okay, oh, okay, okay. I All right, so, um, na baki ama. Yeah. Hello. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh -huh. From the ECG, I think the fact that <clears throat> there is a QRS complex, it, it means that the ventricle is working, if I can use that phrase. And okay. since, yeah. yeah, so so it's the P wave that is abnormal. So the abnormality yes. must be coming from the atrium and not the yes. ventricle. So I, yes. I think that also explains that the pathology is atrial. Not yes. particular. I don't I don't know if that is enough. <laughs> oh, that, that is also good. That is also good. Like I said, if we di we didn't want to go into the details of the but that is very good because if you were to conclude, if it was not for ACLS purposes, like I said, you should be able to describe each component of it. But this one is a focus to help us make decisions when we do our rhythm and pulse check. It's a narrow re complex regular tachycardia. The differentials are there. If you are able to tell straight away it's an atrial flutter, that is good. But if we are to go into atrial flutter, multifocal atrial tachycardia and the others, it will be difficult to exhaust. So we are using the, this approach, which will still let us be able to make clinical decision when we are running a code. You understand? So I agree with you. Clearly, the, the pathology is atrial in origin. Because okay. you are not seeing a P wave. What you Thank are seeing you. looks like a P wave, but it's like the short tooth appearance, as we say. Thank you. So all I'm saying is that if you know the rhythms, say it. But if you are you are you are not sure, you, are, you just go stepwise. Is there a tachycardia? Yes. Is it narrow complex? Yes. Is it white complex? Yes. Is it regular? However, you just use that. And you realize that you will still be able to manage your patient. OK, so we had this. So the P waves are the flatter waves. The PR interval you can't measure. It was as complex, like we said. So it will flatter. OK, good. So we go to the next one. So imagine this as your ECG, okay? I want you to analyze, if you could see my pointer, this part, starting from this part of the ECG. Okay, but this part of the ECG, you can still use that information as you please, but I want a comment on this part of the ECG. Any take, please. Any take, please. So you have a patient on the monitor. This was the rhythm. OK. And all of a sudden, you start seeing this part this part of it, what is it? Just by using the same steps you've described. Who wants to take a shot? Hello? Yeah, hello. 
Yeah, I don't know whether it's me, but the slide is not showing. I'm not seeing any slide. So maybe it's me, I don't know. Um, is anyone also not seeing the rhythm? Oh, I can see. I can see. Okay, then it means probably it's my internet. Okay. Eugene, can I try? Um, so, I agree. Okay, so um, from the beginning, I can see clear P waves before the QRS complexes. But then when it gets to the point you are talking about, I can't really see P waves before um, the QRS complexes. Okay, so what does and, that tell you? Uh, so <laughs> I guess it tells me that afterwards the it's like the P wave is non-existent. Either it's been sort of swallowed up by the QRS or something. Because subsequently so, you see that, mm -hmm. So when you don't see the P waves, what does it tell you? Is it sinus or not sinus? Sorry, it's not sinus. So it's it started as sinus. Okay. And then it became it wasn't sinus. Oh, okay, yes. so it's not sinus. So what is the next step? And, what do you want to do next? Then when you look at the RR, in terms of reading the ECG, sorry. No, you're doing well, uh, continue. You said when you look at the RR. Yeah, so when you look at the R intervals also, the heart rate also changes. So initially you have about um, one, two, three, four, four big boxes and one small box. That comes about 21 small boxes. So that would be like 1,500 over 21. And subsequently, when you come down the line, it looks like the hour interval starts reducing. And when it gets to the part that you're not having the sinus rhythms, the hour intervals are, um, shall I say, closer. So I'll need a calculator to actually get the, the no, actual you, rate. You, you mentioned it, I'll calculate for you. Okay, so initially we have um, 21, so 1,500 over 21. So it was 71. Okay. 71, great. And then it, there's, um, um, so this is five, nine, so that's 10. So that'll be 1,500 over 10. Okay, so that's 150. Great, uh, so I guess that'll be the range. <laughs> okay, so you've determined the heart rate as 1,150. What next? So this, it would be um, um, a narrow, complex, irregular tachycardia. So yes, I understand why you're saying irregular, but I say ignore the first part. Just give me your conclusion on the last part. Okay, so then it's a narrow, complex, regular tachycardia. Good. A so sin it's a is that sinus? A yes, so <laughs> it's a, because when you use the word narrow, complex, regular tachycardia, definitely okay, it's not it's, sinus. It's not sinus. Ah, so it tells you that there are possibilities, okay? So all the narrow, complex, regular tachycardias can present like this. There are ways of distinguishing them between the supraventricular tachycardias, but that will be going into a domain which we are not going to cover here. But for this, so it's a narrow, complex, regular tachycardia. I agree with you. So what you clearly demonstrated that this was a patient who had what? A sinus rhythm and all of a sudden develops a tachycardia where you don't see P waves. So it's not sinus and it's regular. So this is a clear demonstration of a paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia. So another term for narrow complex regular tachycardias is supraventricular. Because like we said, if you are coming above the ventricle, you are narrow. If you are below, you are wide. You understand? So you may use you may see some people use the term 
supraventricular tachycardias, you capture all forms of narrow complex tachycardias. You understand? So this is a demonstration of a paroxysmal, paroxysmal because it came all of a sudden and it can go back, okay? So basically that's what we wanted to demonstrate here, but that was good. So narrow complex regular tachycardia, okay? So that is it. Okay, so now we are going to the ventricular arrhythmias. So with the ventricular ones, it's either a ventricular tachycardia or a ventricular fibrillation. Okay, those are the main ones when it comes to ACLs. It's either a ventricular tachycardia or a ventricular fibrillation. And from your manual, you know that when it comes to a ventricular tachycardia, it's dependent on whether it's a ventricular, you can have a pulseless ventricular tachycardia or a ventricular tachycardia with a pulse and your approach is different. And if you remember, your book talked about polymorphic ventricular tachycardia and said you should treat it as something else, even if there's a pulse. Would that one, you, we'll discuss that when you come for it. So basically, I'm going to look at the ventricular arrhythmias. Is there any question before we go to the ventricular arrhythmias? OK, so we'll try and finish the ventricular ones. Then if there's time, we'll do the bradycardias. But if there's no time, probably we'll look for another time to finish that one up. So basically, if the origin of the tachycardia is coming from the ventricle, like I said, if you are going to the normal SA node, AV node, you are fast. But if you are not going through that pathway and you are going, the impulse is starting lower down then it takes a longer time to complete. So when you look at your KRS complex morphology, that can give you an idea that your tachycardia is likely of ventricular origin or not. So like we said, if you are above the ventricles, you are narrow complex. If you are below the ventricle, if you are within the ventricles or lower down, you are what? Wide. So when you see a wide complex tachycardia, then it's likely is coming from where? Below the AV node. It, that means somewhere within the ventricle. They are what we call junctional tachycardias, which even though they are coming from below the AV node, they are narrow, but won't go into that. So for the purposes of this presentation, if it's wide complex, treat it more likely as a ventricular origin than saying it's a, a supraventricular tachycardia with a bundle branch block or with an aberrant conduction or with pre-excitation. That one is more in the domain of experts. And in your book, you know that they spoke about expert opinion, which comes in. But for the algorithm, for the practice, for the training, for patient's care, if you have a wide complex tachycardia, which is unstable, take it as ventricular than to take it as patient has a, a, a supraventricular tachycardia with a bundle branch block or a supraventricular tachycardia with an aberrant conduction. Okay, so basically, like we said, Hello? Sound is gone. Gene has gone off a little bit. So let's give him a few minutes. I'm sure he'll be back on.
So um, we have talked about determining if an ECG strip is sinus or not, and then um, categorizing them into whether we are dealing with a narrow complex um, tachyarrhythmia or wide complex tachyarrhythmia. Now, the rhythm, the reason why it's a, a bit important to be able to classify on that basis is that the therapy, like when you're actually dealing with arrest rhythms, peri-arrest rhythms, um, or rhythms which patients who are stable or unstable, and you'd learn about what makes someone with a, an arrhythmia stable or unstable, is that um, it sort of helps you stratify which pathway we are going to go. Um, for some of the rhythms, you might have to resort to what we call synchronized cardioversion, um, which is different from um, what you do for other rhythms. There are some rhythms that once the person has it, you are always guaranteed that this person is pulseless. For example, atrial, uh, sorry, ventricular fibrillation. Um, you are not going to have a ventricular fibrillation patient that would have a pulse. And so what intervention you are going to do is going to be different from if you had someone who had maybe a narrow complex tachycardia um, has a pulse, but somehow is unresponsive or fits the criteria for instability. Um, so that's really why it's important to put it into context. If you are able to go beyond that and identify that this is uh, polymorphic or monomorphic VTAC and everything, that's great for you. And that's awesome. And I would like you to keep on that. But it makes it the decision easier if you are just using the morphology and then making your therapy on that basis. I think Eugene is back on, so I'll let him go on. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you Dr. Solomon. Um, my internet went off, I'm sorry. So um, Solomon, I think someone had already answered and you were giving a response. No, 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 we're just, I was just, we're just chatting, sort of. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So can someone take us through if you saw this rhythm and pulse check, there's a pause, this is your rhythm. What rhythm is this one? Based on what we've discussed, how to approach it, what would this rhythm be? Hello. Um, hello. Yes. Yes. Um, there, there is no P QRS P complex. There is so no. There is no P wave and no QRS no. complex. So you it's, see, it's you not, don't see a QRS complex. I I don't know whether this is a a, a, a big P wave. It, it is not a normal appearing rhythm. Yes, so Please. there's no P wave, that one I agree with you. Yes, I, I, I don't know whether what I'm seeing is an abnormal P wave or an abnormal QRS complex. Okay. I, I, I don't know if you understand what I mean. So it's not yeah, a sinus rhythm. Yes, that I agree with you. Yes. But so clearly not, there is no P wave, I agree with you, but there is a QRS complex. Okay, so, so that is the QRS complex, okay. So this is a wide QRS complex. Okay. So why why do you think it's wide? Because it's more than the the maximum of one to three boxes. Okay. So I think uh, in terms of the small boxes, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I think it's seven or so. Okay. So and I think the normal is one to three. Yes. Yes. So, 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 where do you think the the you see you see the KRS complex the R? Where do you think the R is pointing, top or down? It's, it's pointing up with a P Q R 
the, the R is up. The R is up. Is up. Okay. Yeah. So if you look at this one, your QRS complex is actually a pointing, the, the whole complex is pointing down, like the tip oh, of the triangle is down, if you appreciate okay. it. Okay, okay. So that that is, I was I was thinking that the wave is the abnormal QRS complex. So okay. it is you, okay, you so I get to, it now. You get it now. So yeah, I get it, it now. Okay. Is it regular or irregular? Uh well, let me count the number. I think it's regular. Well, if the okay. R wave, the distance between each R wave, I think is the same. Okay. The same eight or nine boxes, yeah. Okay, so at the end, what will you conclude for this rhythm? It is not in, okay, the, hi, there's, there's a P wave. Okay. This, you see a P wave. No, I, I thought you said there's a P wave. No, 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 no. You said oh, it is, there's no P wave. So there's it's not no sinus. P wave. I agree with yeah. you. Okay. You said it is regular. I agree with you. Yeah, you no. said it is wide complex. I agree with you. The only thing left is you've not given us your rates. Uh -huh, my rates. Okay. So wait, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So 1,500 divided by nine. Uh, I'm coming. So that's 166.7. Yeah, okay, uh -huh, 166. Okay, so, so it, what, what will it be, your conclusion? So this is a tachycardia. Okay, what form of tachycardia is it? It's a wide complex tachycardia. It's a wide complex tachycardia, but can you qualify your wide complex? Is it regular or irregular? Yeah, so it's a regular wide complex tachycardia. Yeah, so it's a wide complex irregular tachycardia. You understand? So if you are able to make that decision, then the absence or the presence of pulse will let you know the next line of action. Okay, because if you see a wide complex regular tachycardia or wide complex irregular tachycardia, for these purposes, we said what it's likely what ventricular. Okay. Yeah. So you can say okay. it's a ventricular tachycardia. Tachycardia. Okay. Yes, but if you don't want to commit yourself or in the heat of the moment, you can say it's a wide complex regular tachycardia, the likely a VT, because it may not necessarily be a VT, like I said. So you can say it's a wide complex irregular tachycardia. My patient has a pulse, okay? So it's a wide complex tachycardia with a pulse or a VT with a pulse. Then now you go to the next step. Is it stable? or unstable, you understand? Then your, your manual tells you what to use to determine whether the person is stable or unstable, then you act on it. So you see how you do it. So yes. it's it not necessarily, if you rhythm and pulse check, then you are stuck because you want to remember VT and it's not coming. You can still say something and act. You can say it's a wide complex, regular tachycardia and still based on that you make a decision because the differentials for wide complex regular tachycardia is a ventricular tachycardia or any supraventricular tachycardia with a bundle band block an aberrant conduction or a pre-excitation but we said for the purposes of acls we are not going to do how to distinguish whether it's an a, a, a svt with a bundle band block with an aberrant conduction you understand that is yes. not the emphasis. Mm -hmm. So good. Perfect. All right. Thank you. So she said it was 160. She was regular. Clearly didn't see P waves. She said it, there was none. So it wasn't sinus. The PI interval, if you are not seeing a P wave clearly, you can measure it. Then PI's duration was clearly wide. So it was a wide complex regular tachycardia which ventricular tachycardia is a differential. Good. So that is it. All right, so this one, the answer is at the top. But assuming we didn't see this, can someone take us through, ignoring the heading? What is this? What does it tell you? Going through the same steps.
not Asian. Mining. Yeah. No, I want another person. Oh. Bani has not answered any question yet. Ah, but he wasn't he the first one who spoke. With the he keeps asking idea. questions, but he hasn't answered any yet. <laughs> okay, then I mistook him for the one who answered the body card. Okay, Bani, then I'm sorry. Take this one. Oh, I answered the body card, but I can answer this one too. No, let another person, please. Can someone else also give this a shot, please? Oh, okay. Okay, Eugene, let me let me answer. Oh, okay, Come please on. go ahead. Okay, so um looking at the ECG, um, I'll start with the rate and then uh, um looking at the rate, so um let's see. Uh, and so looking at the rate, it's really fast at certain sections. So I'm um, sorry, let me, I'm trying to open it well. I've missed the slide. Uh-huh. Okay. So if I take um the the second the second aspect where I can see clearly that it's it's broad, just like comparing to the previous one, the rate is very fast, about 300, um, about 300. I don't see any um, P with before the QRS complexes. Um, looking at the rhythm, looking at the rhythm, um, it, it's, it's difficult to, I would say that it's, it's not regular. It's not regular. Okay. And then looking at the QRS complexes, they are broad, definitely okay. more than the three, more than the okay. three small boxes. Um, and because they they are wide, I'll say that they are broad. It's a broad com broad complex, um, irregular, um, tachycardia, and then the shapes. So it's so difficult to so it's not the same looking at the left side looking at the middle so i think um it's polymorphic so that's the, that's why they name polymorphic different shapes so i don't know oh, if okay. i can say like a ventricular the broad complex irregular tachycardia let me put it that way okay so so that's good so Always, so it, she is. It's a wide complex or broad complex, irregular tachycardia. But as much as possible, start with whether it is you are seeing P, so that you know you are not dealing with sinus. The regularity clearly, you were, you, you could tell it was irregular. So if you're going to determine the rates, you would have had to use it like a six seconds or a ten seconds rule, depending on your rhythm shape. Then, then the next thing is to now look at your KRS complex, which is clearly broad. So it's a wide, complex, irregular tachycardia, like you said. I agree with you. And the differentials could be what? The polymorphic VT, okay? Or this one is quite broad. You may have one that is quite small and fine. That may even qualify for um, a VF. Okay, so the differentials for a polymorphic VT or a, a wide complex irregular tachycardia could be a VT or a polymorphic VT, you understand, to make it simple. But at the end, if you read your, if you read your manual, if you see that the management approach is what? The same. So you say it's wide complex irregular tachycardia does not affect you wrongly managing your patients. You understand? So that was good. So clearly polymorphic, you see some pointing up, some pointing down, basically means that the origin of the impulse is coming from various parts of the ventricle. You understand? And even though it's a polymorphic VT clearly, the reason why when you make it wide complex irregular tachycardia, it opens your, your, your options up for you to think about the possibilities that apart from a polymorphic VT, there may be other reasons why it is like that. But clearly this is polymorphic VT. But if you see a wide complex irregular tachycardia, you are also correct. Okay. Doc, I have a question. Please go ahead. You know, when you're explaining 
the rates for the, it will seem like I'm bringing us back. Okay, maybe then I'll ask another time. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. The rates regarding the, the irregular rhythms. Yes. I, I was actually driving, so I didn't hear that bit. The issue about the six and then 10, I, I didn't get it. So basically, when we started, um, so you know what, when we finish, just stay on, I'll go there and show you the squares. But basically the principle we were using was that the big square is 200 milliseconds, okay? Or 0 0.2 seconds. Now, heart rate is what? Beat per minute, okay? So a minute is 60 seconds, but we can print 60 seconds of paper to count the number of QRS complex within that 60 seconds, because each QRS complex is taking us a ventricular contraction in simple terms. So if it is irregular, then you need to count the number of QRS complexes in 60 seconds, which we can't, because you won't get a 60 second sprint, because if each big box is 0 0.2 seconds. Imagine how many of that boxes will make 60 seconds. So what you need is that the rhythm strip comes in six seconds or 10 seconds, depending on the ECG strip you are using. Some six seconds, some 10 seconds, okay? Now, if it's a six second strip that you have, within that QRS complexes, you have, you count the number of QRS complexes within that six seconds. And that will give you the, the heartbeat in six seconds. But the heartbeat is supposed to be per minute. So the number you calculated within the six seconds, you multiply by 10. And that will give you the number of QRS complex in what, 60 seconds. And that will be what, in heartbeat in one minute. If you had a 10 second strip and you counted the number of QRS complex within that 10 seconds, then to get 60 seconds, you multiply 10, the 10 seconds straight by what, six. So that's the six second rule or the 10 second rule. Oh, thank you very much, sir. Eugene, please, I have a, a quick question as well. Yes, please, Abna, go ahead. Uh -huh. Please, you said some are facing, some of the QRS complexes are facing up and some are down. So the first eight or so, are those ones, mm, Pointing it's down. Up or down. Yes, I, that, that confusion comes a lot. But <laughs> clearly, yes, I get your point. So if, if, if you look at it uh, with this one, you could see that they are pointing up. All These right. ones are pointing up, and the subsequent ones are pointing down. Oh, and then, okay. so, it's, so, but what is important is that if you're not sure, you can see some of them are in different directions. That okay. should be enough to All make right. a decision. Okay. The importance of you knowing that is polymorphic. In your manual, if you remember that if assuming I told you, let's see how many have exhausted the manual since you brought the question up. So not at if, all. <laughs> if if you had this patient, okay, and you did a rhythm and pulse check, and we told you there was a pulse, okay, for this patient, this patient has a pulse, okay. So it's a wide complex irregular tachycardia with a pulse, okay, and you ask the questions of stability. Let's say your patient was conscious. Do you have chest pain? He says, no. You ask for the blood pressure. I tell you blood pressure is 130 over 80. Okay? You listen to the chest. There's no pulmonary edema. The patient's sensorium is intact. Okay? There is no evidence of um, poor perfusion. So you say that this tachycardia is stable. Okay, but it is polymorphic. What will you do? We'll leave this one and talk about it. Let me not worry, but you get it. So there are components in your manual that highlight some decisions to be made. Okay. Okay. Right. Assuming this rhythm was, assuming even the patient was unstable and there was a pulse, okay you would have said that because it's, there's, a, there's a pulse and it's unstable, you are going to do synchronized cardioversion. But with polymorphic VT, 
your book said something about that decision. Okay, so I'm, I'm just giving you a heads up. So basically, it's important to know some of these things to make a decision ahead. Do you understand? Thank you. Yeah. All right. Okay, so who will take this one? We have, we are almost, our time is up. We have just four minutes. So um, if you've noticed the Zoom meeting has not gone off, um, can see um, a colleague has this um, access that I had to borrow to use for this lecture or this tutorial. He also has a meeting at eight o'clock. So we'll have to be finishing. So we may have to continue some other time. So if someone can do this, for us. Hello. 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 Yes, sir. Yeah, so here we also have <clears throat> uh, this is a very this is irregular. Um, the complexes are broad. Um, if I look at the reads, uh, with the first one, two, between the Q, the RR intervals, um, you are looking at just one box. No, one. So before you determine whether you're going to use one box between the two R, R interval, what decision are you supposed to make before you decide your method? Whether it's regular or not. Do you think it's regular? No, it's not, it's not regular. So which one are you supposed to use to calculate your rates? I'll have to find out whether it's a 10 second strip or Okay, but this so one, let's, assume, let's assume it's a six second strip. It's a six second strip. Hey, I'll have to count all these things. <laughs> one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27. So 27 times 10. No, no, I said it says as picked as six seconds. Ah, six seconds. Yeah, so times 10, yeah. So times 10, yes. Yeah. So 270. Beats. Okay. Yeah. So, so what, what does that tell you? Um this, this is a tachycardia. Okay, so now you need to define your tachycardia. So it's a ventricular tachycardia because the QRS complexes are broad. Okay. It's, it's also irregular. Okay. So it's an irregular, uh, broad complex ventricular tachycardia. Okay. So, uh, so if you are going to say it's wide complex or broad complex irregular tachycardia, you can add ventricular in addition. Okay. Okay. You understand? So if you say it's wide complex irregular tachycardia, then that one you've left it open that it could be a vent, it could be a polymorphic VT, or it can actually even be a VF ventricular fibrillation, you understand? Mm -hmm. But if you want to use the word ventricular, then if you say it's a VT, it means I'm saying it's not a VF because okay. you are sure it's a VT, you understand? So the That's wide complex, regular or irregular is like an umbrella term. All right. Do you get it? So irregular, wide complex, irregular tachycardia. Yeah. So. It's a wide complex irregular tachycardia. So if you have to stick your head out, let's say you are doing this in your exam, end of the train, this is there, and they give you possible answers. Mm. Which one will you choose? The possible answers will not have wide complex, regular, or irregular. There will be a VT, VF. So which of them will you choose? VT or a VF? This is a VT. Okay, all right. So let's see. 
it's very regular. E waves not seen. ER interval, you can definitely see it. Okay. All right. So that is it. It's a VF. But I understand you saying it's a VT is not far from practically if this patient has no pulse. Okay. Like I said, if you said it was a wide complex irregular tachycardia and there was no pulse, definitely you know that you are going to defibrillate. Okay. Because it's straight away. If, it was, if it's a VF, clearly there will not be any pulse. So at the end, that's why we are saying that if you say it's wide, complex, irregular tachycardia, you are left with two main options. You're either dealing with a polymorphic VT, if it's irregular, or a VF. The two of them, your book tells you what to do, and it's the same. You understand? So at the end, at the end, the decision making is what is most important. Boss, what made this one a fibrillation? What made this one a fibrillation? So, you know, like I say, if your if your if your your child is learning how to write, or if there's something called ashukushukui. <laughs> so, like I always say, make it say if it looks like ashukushukui, it's a VF. But I get your point. This one's. Um, if you, I, how many of you have done your pretest already? Oh, we are supposed to do a pretest before coming. The, the, the compulsory one, the online. You know you're supposed to do the compulsory uh, pretest before you come. Oh, the, I haven't done it yet. I think I have to Okay, do don't it. worry. You just yeah. have to. You should have done it on the, even on the day you, could have, you, could, you can do it before entering the room. You could do it as yeah. many times. So then I reserve my comments on that. Okay, because of time, um, I think uh, we'll end here. So if we are done with the mainly ma majority of what we are supposed to do, what we are left with is the hard blocks, then we are done. So basically what we've done today is to let you approach it systematically, okay? If you see an ECG, you ask yourself, am I seeing P waves? Is it sinus, okay? And we say the sinus rhythm is you are seeing P waves before every KRS complex. If you are not seeing the P wave, the conclusion is simple. It is not sinus. If it's not there, it is not there. Don't force yourself to see it. If you are not seeing it, it's not there. So it's not sinus. Then we say the next thing is, is it regular or irregular? So you measure the distance between your RR interval. So that will help you decide which method to use to calculate the rates. If it is irregular, we said, use 300 divided by the number of two large box, the number of the large boxes in between the RR interval to get your rates. Or if you're not getting the large boxes, use the number of small boxes, which is the 0 0.04 second or 40 millisecond box. And that will be your denominator, your numerator will be 1,005. If it is an irregular rhythm, we said heartbeat is beats per minute. A minute is 60 seconds, but we cannot print a 60 seconds paper. Well, the monitor cannot show you 60 seconds. Okay, so if you have the ECG paper, you are looking at what, six seconds or 10 seconds. If you have the six seconds strip, how many KRS complex are within that six seconds? We say each KRS complex consider it as equal to a ventricular contraction. So the number of KRS complexes you count in the six seconds, you multiply by 10 and that will give you the number of KRS mm -hmm. complex in 60 seconds, which will be your heartbeat per minute. If you have a 10 second strip, you count for the number of KRS complex within that 10 second strip and you multiply by six and that will give you 60 seconds and that will be your heart rate, ventricular heart rate. Then the next thing is that you come and look at the individual components of your ECG. Are my P waves normal? Is my PR interval normal? Is my KRS complex narrow or broad? It is my QT interval or QTC normal. But like we said, for the purposes, we did not go into QT and QTC, but the first part of it is what is necessary. Now, if it's a tachycardia, we say what you need to determine is, is this tachycardia narrow complex or wide complex? Is narrow complex, is it regular or irregular? It is wide complex. 
Is it regular or irregular? If you can do it this way, it's a bit easier, especially in making um, clinical decisions when it comes to running the code. But if you are able to tell straight away, we show you the rhythm and you can tell it's a VT, it's an atrial flutter, it's an atrial fibrillation, it's a, a paroxysmal SVT, it's a what complete heart block, it's a Mobis 2. If you can say that from the beginning, it, it helps. It will help you make a clinical decision that probably someone who is starting, let's say, a bradycardic algorithm and is going through the steps. Remember, if you're able to tell it's a complete heart block straight away, your decision for pacing will be faster than starting from it's a bradycardia where you will try a tropin. It won't work because it's complete heart block and you'll be trying dopamine and we'll still be telling your patient it's unstable before you go and do your pacing. Your patient will still be alive because you would have gone through the processes like logically. But if you knew it was a complete heart block up at initial, maybe your decision for pacing will be faster. Basically, that's all we are saying. But at the end, be systematic. Okay, so it's a narrow, complex, regular tachycardia. Then you ask yourself, you should know the differential diagnosis for the narrow, complex, regular tachycardia. That it could be a paroxysmal SVT, it could be an atrial flutter. Okay, it, the SVTs, there are several of them, but we are not going to go into it. The AVNRT, AVRT, like we said, that is not the purpose. Yours is to make a clinical decision. It's a narrow, complex, regular tachycardia. It's a narrow, complex, irregular tachycardia. And during the ACLS, you understand why being able to tell whether it's narrow, complex, and irregular complex helps you even decide in the choice of energy to use. Though your, the current update tells us that we are going to have defibrillators, which are going to tell us the energy to use, manufacturer will tell us. For now, we've not seen those defibrillators in country. So we'll still go by the 2015 in terms of the energy choosing, because practically the defibrillators we have now are not the ones that are telling you which energy to use for which arrhythmia. So knowing the regularity and the, whether it's now complex gives you an information of which energy to use. So we'll end here and hopefully we'll try and make time within the week to do the bradycardia and deal with the the hard blocks before we meet on Monday, God willing. Really. Thank you very much. If there's any question I'll take, if there's no other question, um, I want to say thank you for all those who were able to join this presentation. Thanks to my colleagues, um, Dr. Solomon, Terry, and everyone who made this presentation a success. Big thank you to Dr. Dominic Akatiba for giving us this link to you. So we are grateful. So we'll hopefully meet in the course of the week or next week sunday before the day further discussions will happen on the whatsapp page thank you very much thank you